Hello again. Um, this is a video being recorded approximately 10 minutes after the last one because I just noticed a, um, a question from the Deep Pacific podcast and I am such a terrible human being that this comment was made a month ago. Um, but I'm going to make a video about it now anyway. And it's to do with fermentation. I made a throwaway comment about fermentation uh, fundamentally being burying things in the ground and letting them ferment. And they were curious uh, because of Chamora traditions fermenting breadfruit underground and how that exactly works and it has to do with what fermentation is. Uh, fermentation is a, is a preservation method, I'm just going to pat my cat because he's in the way, um, preservation method that uses alcohol um, as a preserving method. There is a percentage of alcohol approximately uh, about two and a half percent uh, from the top of my head as a pure preserving agent at which alcohol is a um, antimicrobial agent powerful enough to prevent the growing of fruit-based pathogens. Now that's actually what, why beer was created. Um, if you have beer, if you have water just sitting around uh, in a large barrel or what have you, um, it will grow amoeba. It will grow slime and when you drink it, it will kill you. Making beer um, through the process of adding sugar to water and then adding yeast um, creates a environment that is hostile towards um, harmful microbial activity. Um, incidentally, the microbial activity in water is one of the reasons why if you go to a strange city you may get diarrhea. It's from the water. Your body is not used to um, used to the pathogens that are in that particular city. This even happens in theoretically first world nations such as the United States, Australia, um, Europe. I know Europe's not a nation, but I'm not going to sit there and name out every freaking country. Um, and it has to do with the accepted microbial um, activity that you get used to when you live in a city. Uh, when you go visit a city, you're brand new. You don't have that uh, flora in your gut and it can make you sick uh, and it's also one of the things that will make water taste differently. So um, hops in beer as well is another preserving agent. Um, it acts through uh, just through the nature of the um, I cannot remember that. I've been at work today so I'm not exactly with it but um, hops contains a certain uh, chemicals and trace elements as part of the hops uh, the hops plant hop, hops vines um, immune system that will boil out much the same way as eucalyptus that will help um, help prevent you help prevent water from spoiling uh, inappropriate combinations it also tastes bitter that's one of the reasons why um, things that generally taste bitter are uh, 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 antimicrobial. This is not a hard and fast. Well, it's a hard and fast rule. It's not a particularly good one. It's more of a general guideline, um, and it's why ingestion of bitter things in high concentrations can be toxic. Once again, just simple rule of thumb: do not take anything I say in this video as survival information. A bit more as general general entertainment <laughs> from a heavily tattooed chef. So anyway. <laughs> back to Chamorro, uh, fermenting breadfruit by burying it underground. Now, fermentation involves yeast. Um, this is why bread and beer pretty much show up at the same time. If you grind flour, add water, it will grow yeast, it will grow yeast and that will bubble. If it's really thick, it'll be bread. If it's really thin, it'll be beer. Fundamentally, the same process that goes on to make both of them. And to prove it, there's a type of beer that comes from Germany called Goza and it's beer made with brackish or salt water. Um, so people that sit there and say, oh, baker's yeast is different to brewer's yeast, kind of, but not really. Um, the only big difference is the alcohol, um, alcohol tolerances of the various strains. So what happens is when something ferments, yeast grows in it, um, generally in a, restricted area or environment that is not exposed to light because UV light will kill yeast. That's why you bury it in the ground to ferment it. Um, and there aren't too many things that grow in the presence of yeast 
that will also grow in an anaerobic environment. Botulism is one of them. Uh, and botulism is a big one. It's less common these days, but botulism is extremely serious and will kill you. Um, get it often enough, if, even if you get it once, just a bad case of it will make you very, very, very sick. And because it's a toxin, much like um, the more serious strains of, e of uh, E. coli, such as H7451, have I got that right? They release what are called Shiga toxins when they die. These toxins cannot and basically have to be filtered out through your kidney, which is why your kidney, your renal system, gets destroyed by these infections and that proceeds to destroy your brain because your immune system starts wiping out the E. coli and the E. coli release toxins as they die. Botulism is the same. Botulism is killed by your immune system, all the antibiotics you've taken, and guess what? You get sicker. Then you go into supportive care, uh, and hopefully you don't suffer renal failure. But botulism is as serious as the bad cases of E. coli. It's just not very common. Anyway, so to ferment breadfruit by burying it in the ground, you're providing the yeast, and yeast occurs everywhere. Um, don't believe me? That's how wine started being made. You squeeze juice, leave it, and it will ferment. It's how a star sourdough starter is made. Wild yeast is everywhere. So the fruit is absolutely covered in it. And when the fruit becomes extremely ripe, the yeast is able to eat it. I don't know the exact specifics of fermenting breadfruit. Never had enough to play with. Um, and also, I kind of just like cooking it. Uh, toasting it like it's bread. Um, I kind of, I'm a simple man. I have simple pleasures. And especially fried in a little bit of uh, beef tallow. There is nothing better than breadfruit. Yeah, I know it's a vegan, but so are cows, and cows are tasty. Um, so anyway, the fermentation of it, the yeast will go from the skin, grow into it, and as the sugars are released as part of the enzyme breakdown uh, from the overripe breadfruit, it will start to ferment. Now the reason it would have been buried in the ground as opposed to using a pot, for example, with uh, kimchi, for example, these are specifically made pots, is during the Austronesian expansion through the Pacific, one of the technologies that fell by the wayside was pottery. Because volcanic islands don't have a lot of clay. Clay is made up of very fine silt and decaying organic material. You don't have that on a volcanic island. Volcanic islands aren't old enough to have thick layers of silt. So instead of having pottery, we got the ability to sail across the ocean. Kind of a fair trade. But that means we're limited. Our food storage was limited to gourds. Hence why uh, filling fresh a gourd up with fresh water and dropping in a hot stone. If you have pottery, you don't have to do that. And it's one of the reasons why uh, Pacific Islanders were so happy to trade for iron. People didn't need to show us how to use an iron pot. We already knew how to cook. Having something that conductive heat conducted heat was just just a godsend. Like like someone using a microwave today. It, it everybody used it as much as possible. Um, I have read of accounts from missionaries in which older people in the eighteen forties, eighteen fifties complained that things boiled in an iron pot didn't taste the same compared to dropping a hot rock in a gourd. Um, just to show that people complain about everything was better when they were younger. Um, <laughs> which I think is just cute. Anyway, back to the fermentation. So because fer fermentation is a naturally occurring process and is kind of fundamentally the easiest uh, food preservation method to really get a handle on, um, it does not surprise me, particularly in volcanic soils that are quite alkaline, or can be quite alkaline, bearing in mind if you were to go and find yourself um, a scree slope from a volcano, that beautiful ash, that acrid um, alkaline ash spewed out from the very core of the earth is hostile. It is very hostile to microbial life. You don't have to worry about there being a whole bunch of stuff growing in it. So you could easily pack breadfruit in that, if you're lucky, it will be at an elevated temperature. So you could have your breadfruit happily churning away at 50 odd degrees, buried in a scree slope on the side of a volcano, and get yourself some really nice fermented food surprisingly quickly. The other thing is, by fermenting it, preservation, it extends the period in which you have these foods. And once again, that becomes very important. 
Um, and I think a lot of people today forget just how important food preservation was traditionally. Um, I've mentioned confit before, the process of cooking something and covering it in fat to preserve it. A lot of chefs these days think that confit is a cooking process. It isn't. It is a method of preservation. You're not trying to cook duck so it's tender and juicy, or you're not cooking rabbit so it becomes more moist because that's not how it works. You know, you, you, <laughs> you confit something at approximately 100 degrees, usually 110 degrees. You're going to boil the water off, especially when you cook it for six hours. It doesn't matter how many layers of alcohol you wrap it in. You're going to cook the moisture out of it. But what you do is keep out the oxygen. So now you have something that is shelf stable. That's what you're doing. Yes, we know the French then turned around and proceeded to fry it up and eat it. And oh my God, it's so tasty. But it was about preserving the duck. It was preserving uh, the titty um, in Etarawa with the Maori. Um, it is the same with all sorts of preservation under fat that is done the world over. It is a preservation method first, and it's not a method of cooking. It's definitely not the best way to cook something to get the flavor out of it. Uh, if you wanted to do that, you can boil your duck legs or what have you, the food that you would traditionally confit. You can boil it in a stock, and it will be just as tasty, but it won't keep which is why coffee exists. And that's why fermentation exists. It is a preservation method. And without being able to do any real research on Tremora cooking techniques, because unfortunately this is a black box, the Pacific when it comes to trying to study the cooking techniques of the Pacific is, the, the information is all out there on the islands. No one has ever collated it because people don't care. Well, I care. Um, <laughs> if I get enough people to support me on Patreon, I'd happily sell the Pacific and write all these things down and come up with definitive guides to the different islands and the foods that they have for no other reason so that islanders would be able to treasure and keep their heritage in the future. Um, but, <laughs> back to fermenting briefly. I think the easiest way, if you know of a thing like this that is done historically, find yourself a UV non-transparent container and just try it. Um, speak to your grandparents. Um, if you're uh, on an island or you have access to um, your culture and can sit there and you know ask the old people, so how is this done? How, how do we go how do we go about fermenting breadfruit? I think you'll find that the technique will be surprisingly simple and once again as long as you follow a few simple rules such as keep it keep it away from the light, and when in doubt, you can ferment things in the fridge. If you don't like the idea of getting your breadfruit and burying it on the side of a volcano and leaving it there for three weeks, don't. Get yourself a plastic, a bucket like this one that doesn't let light through. Put your breadfruit in that, pack it in ash, uh, and then put it in the fridge for three weeks. Uh, it might take longer than three weeks to do it, but you can add controls to it to be safe. Um, so, I'm not sure if this really asks the question as how or why of the, the exact hows and whys of Tremora fermented breadfruit, but that's, that's how you would get to it. That's how I would get to it. Um, honestly, if I had access to a boat, I would just sail to the islands and talk to old people about it. Um, and once again, this comes down to the problem with most historical records is they have not kept technical aspects of our culture alive because the people that made the records were not technical people. I could not, even if you sat there and described it to me, I would not be able to um, do a comparative study of the different Atua spirits of the Pacific because I, you know, but I can sit there and talk about food and the problem is the people that went to the Pacific Islands and first started recording everything back then were god botherers. They were beach shakers. They went there to spread their gospel. So we have really good records of the religion of, or the religious aspects of Pacifica culture. Basically nothing on the day-to-day -day stuff because missionaries don't know about cooking. They never have, they never will. They're intensely impractical people, which is why uh, Terry Pratchett, Sir Terry Pratchett famously said that it's so important to shoot missionaries on site. 
um, if you are a missionary and watching this and feel deeply offended, the idea I've suggested, um, I've just quoted a guy that's saying you should be shot on sight. Good. I'm deeply offended that you came to the Pacific and destroyed the cultures you found there. Um, and while you may not be old enough to have done it yourself, the fact that you are, <laughs> are a missionary is you're carrying on that proud tradition. And part of that proud tradition is the fact that you're a genocidal maniac. Anyway, sorry to end on such a negative note, but if you want to find out uh, the specifics of Pacifica peoples, how they did things, the easiest way to do is to ask Pacifica people. Um, I hope the Pacific that this answers, or at least leads a way to help you um, learn more about the various uh, fermentation methods. But fundamentally, fermentation is about controlling access to oxygen and light and letting nature do its thing. So, yeah. Uh, shout out to my Patreons. Thank you for making this possible. Um, I'll leave a link to my Patreon after this video. I guess I should. Um, if you want to throw money in the pot, cool. If you don't, cool. Um, I'm probably going to keep doing this on a regular basis anyway because it's something I kind of enjoy when I can remember to do it and I have something to talk about. Anyway, see you.